in this episode of The Mind Pump. So look, in this episode, we answer questions from listeners like you who post questions on our Instagram page, but we also talk about current events, our lives, and the people that we partner with. That's in the intro portion of this episode. So here's what we talked about for the first 37 minutes, the intro portion. We talked about our new partner, Nutrition Coaching Institute. This is the company owned by our good friend Jason Phillips. It's a phenomenal place you can go if you're a coach and you want to become an online coach, you want to be a better online coach, to learn how to work with nutrition with your clients. But here's the deal. We got you, um, we're going to give away actually two people a free scholarship. So here's how you apply. Go to applywithnci.com forward slash mind pump, fill out the form, and two of you this month will win a nutritional coaching bundle scholarship valued at over $6,500. Then we talked about beefcake season. This is uh, this is the season of bulking, apparently. Beefcake. I'm getting a, a little heavy. I'm getting thick. Yeah, you got a thickness about yourself. There's a lot of C's there. Uh, then we talk about our trip to Tahoe. That was a lot of fun. Adam talks about how he went fishing and caught fishes. Good times. We talked about PRX. That. <laughs> PRX, another one of our partners who makes phenomenal home gym equipment and actually has a payment plan. So you can buy the home gym equipment to a payment plan. So instead of paying your gym to rent yeah. their equipment. Why not own one? Yeah. Why not own your own, your own gym? That way it's not all filthy and covered with sweat from the hairy dude that was on the machine before oh, you. that guy always. Then we talked about Halloween movies and how one of those movies had Justin trying to explain to his nine and five-year-old what a virgin was. Come on, Disney. I thought, <laughs> I thought it was safe. Then we talked about Chicago and how they decriminalized the use of psychedelic uh, mushrooms and other plants. Maybe uh, on it will move there. Yeah. We talked Deep about- dish, pizza, and uh, mushrooms. We talked about creatine and cancer. Believe it or not, creatine may actually help the body fight cancer. You thought it was good for your biceps. Not just that. It's good for cancer too. Wow. And then we talked about what makes people charismatic because, of course, we're charismatic as hell. All of us. Then we got to the fitness portion of this episode. Uh, the first question was, uh, this person says, hey, you guys don't love machines, but what are your favorite machines and why? So we talk about machines and their value. I love robots. The next uh, question this person wants to know how to work out and grow their trapezius muscles. Those are the muscles next to your neck. Ooh. Next question. This person has hit a plateau with their deadlift. What can they do to get their deadlift to go up again? Deadlift, one of the best exercises you could do. Works the glutes, the hamstrings, and the backs. We talk all about that. And the final question. This person wants to know what our bad habits are and how we're working on them. And uh, Adam was, of course, in his brilliance, was able to point out my bad habits. <laughs> Thanks, Adam. It <laughs> was actually quite accurate. Yeah. Uh, also, this month, all month long, the only time we're doing, we're doing the sale during the whole year, MAPS Anabolic, one of our most popular fitness programs, is 50% off. So MAPS Anabolic, phenomenal for muscle building, fat loss, and metabolism boosting. It's 50% off. Here's how you get the discount. Go to mapsred.com and use the code... Red 50, R-E-D 5 zero, no space for the discount. Stop whatever dumb program you're doing and do anabolic. This room is the, we'll call it the opposite room from now on. If it's cold outside, right. hot as shit in here. If it's hot as shit out there, freezing in here. If it's a good temperature out there, it's a uncomfortable temperature in here. Yeah. If it's an uncomfortable temperature out there, it's still uncomfortable in here. That's the one time it's the same, Doug, hmm. is when it's uncomfortable everywhere, Still uncomfortable in here. Yeah. Yeah. Uncomfortable I, Bermuda Triangle. I don't know about you guys, but I, I definitely appreciate uh, temperature contrast training. Hmm. Not all the time when I'm trying to podcast, though. You know what I mean? Right. I'm not trying to strengthen that part of myself when I'm <laughs> yeah. podcasting. Yeah. Well, you know what I'm saying? Yeah. When I'm like going for it. Like, I'm going to go sit in the sauna because like, this, I, I want to heat up. You don't have to sit in the sauna. Yeah. You could just sit in your chair in here. You could. And do a podcast and sweat. And then mm. poor Chokey walks in and she's like, mmm, smells. Why is it so musty in here? It smells like man. So yeah. how excited are you guys um, on what we're doing with uh, Jason Phillips going forward? More excited than oh, you sound. yeah. You don't sound very excited. <laughs> Got a little pep in your step. I already there. know how excited I am. I wanted to hear how excited uh, you, you guys are. trying to downplay I don't want to sell you on how excited I am. <laughs> yeah. you know? yeah. Are you excited? Yeah, so, dude, are you kidding me? So is, is all we've ever heard is good 
uh, feedback from his uh, yeah great things yeah nutritional coaching institute. Um, you know, it's a good thing he's doing that because the the online coaching world has just exploded. Yeah, and it's good and bad. It's good because it's a new market; more people have access to more help. It's bad because. Most of them suck. Yeah. Nah, there's a lot the of majority of them suck. <laughs> I mean, let's be honest. Well, like 98%. Of, I remember one of the things that we hit it off with Jason really well, and you know, you and him did a couple of really good YouTube videos together. He's a great communicator, and he's been in the space for a, a long enough time to understand like the value of uh, education and, and then also the value of being able to take that education and um, be able to translate that for the average person to understand. And I think the stuff that he does in his NCI, that's what he does really well. I mean, when we first got on the phone a few months back and we were first starting to have this conversation around, you know, what we would do or how we would work out some sort of a partnership together. Uh, one of the things that he was talking about that, you know, precision nutrition is probably one of the most reputable uh, nutrition institutes that are out there right now. And he says that it's a major feeder system for his business. And I was asking him why, and he says it's because it's incredible information. It's just so high level that the average trainer that goes through it goes through it. They're blown away, feel like they got all this information, but then they don't have the tools to go apply it to their clients as well. And so he kind of filled that gap, he mm -hmm. feels like, and that's why they're doing well, so well. The most important thing for a trainer, I've, I've probably said it a uh, hundred times on the podcast, is how effectively you communicate. You can have all the great information in the world. And a lot of trainers do have a lot of information. They know the steps to burning body fat. They know the steps to building muscle. They know the steps to improving health. But getting your clients to really understand, and not just understand, but apply in long-term, lifelong ways, that's the skill that makes you an effective trainer. Because any, any trainer, can, if you can get a client to just do what you tell them, you know, for three months, great, congratulations. What happens after that three months? Mm -hmm. it, that means you didn't communicate it well enough. You didn't do a good enough job. And so the feedback I get from people who go through the NCI course is exactly that, that they can, they're, they're able to not just learn what they need to learn, but actually effectively apply it to their online clients. They also have uh, courses on nutrition for hormones. You guys know that? Yeah. yeah. So it's just there's there's, there's 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 like level one, level two, but then there's hormone courses so you can help people with nutrition and the hormones. It's extremely extensive. So I'm excited to work with them. And then what's the deal with them? Are, so we, are we giving stuff away, right? Well, what Mind Pump is doing is we're actually going to pay for two people to go through that. So every month we're going to give away. That's what we'll announce on the show yeah. where we will actually give away two of these certifications, which are that two together are valued at like $6,000. So mm -hmm. we're giving away access to all this stuff. I just think that's a cool way to do a partnership. That was something that him and yeah. I talked about for a long while. I was like, you know, instead of us giving like some sort of a discount to uh, our listeners, which I think is cool too. Let's do a scholarship. Yeah. Let's do a scholarship program if you're down for it. And he says, I would love to do that. So, you know, and we'll, we'll continue this on, especially if we get a good response from it. If this is something that trainers uh, are are looking to do, but we'll we'll give away two scholarships every single month as long as it's it's going well and people are mm. appreciating it and liking it. So, well, I'm excited about it. I mean, the best way for us to combat a lot of this bad information out there is start putting more, you know, of these like certified coaches out there that are actually like taught by by somebody that's really reputable. And I think that this is a great program that we can finally lead people towards to you know flood the market with really I, solid information. I, I just got a DM yesterday, I, uh, two of them. I had one girl who DM me and said, hey, I have an online coach and my online coach told me to eat uh, 220 grams of protein uh, every single day. I said, oh, okay. How much do you weigh? 110 pounds? <laughs> okay. Way too much freaking yeah. protein. And the reason why she DM me is because she said, I'm having the following symptoms. I'm bloated. Um, I have low energy. Um, my workouts are suffering. I said, well, how's your digestion? And she says, oh, it's it's okay. And I said, are you having a, a, a bowel movement every day? She says, no, it's every two or three days. Too much damn protein. It's And I'm not going to air out who the coach was, but it's one of those you know, social media Instagram coaches. Then I had another person message me and say, hey, my online coach said that eating fat and carbs in the same meal um, is really, really bad <laughs> for my hormones. Like, what? Yeah. And I know there's some Ayurvedic practices that will talk specifically to certain individuals about combining certain foods, 
But that's just it. It's, it's, it's very, very individual. For the average person, no. There's nothing wrong with eating proteins and carbs and fats all in the same meal. Do you Let's think we're going to see this die off? J Jason and I actually were on the phone yesterday and talking about this, about you know the coaching world online. Do you think that we're we're seeing this huge spike in it because everybody now is an expert if you have X amount of people following you or whatever and, and selling coaching and training online? Do you think we're going to see that plateau and then come back down? I do. Mm -hmm. I think there's going to be a, a little bit of a reckoning. Um, like all markets, is a market... It, it grows it first starts like the like the dot com market um remember when it was the, there was the dot com bust and you had all these companies coming in and they were getting valued at ridiculous amounts because it was the new thing and then a whole bunch of them failed yeah it's like it's any market anytime it's a filtering process yeah and this is new online coaching has really exploded recently because of social media um and because of the false sense of authority because when you go on instagram and you see someone who has 10,000 or 20,000 or 30, 40, 50,000 mm -hmm. followers, the perception is this person must know what they're talking about. But I think that that's starting to change. We're already seeing it now with these these you know so these Insta celebrities who yeah. can't sell more than three t-shirts even though they well, have two Well, you can followers. fake it for so long with like before and after pics and like personal anecdotes and people like, you know, uh, giving their testimonials and all these types of things to kind of like rep your rep you as far as like a coach or, you know, just look at you like visually, like you look awesome, so therefore, you know, you must be providing good information, but well, that like, only lasts so long. Yeah, it's like a shitty restaurant with great advertising. You know, eventually yeah. everybody eats there and it tastes like yeah, shit. And the pictures of the there food look amazing. Yeah. It's so, like, wow, that look that picture of that burger looks amazing. That's what it's like. So you have people that are doubling, tripling down on the advertising, which would be their following, right? Which is, you know, mm -hmm. driven through pictures or gimmicks or whatever to get attention. And then what ends up happening is a, a good portion of those people go through that process and find out like, oh, this just tastes like a mm. fast food restaurant. I'm yeah. cool. I'll move along. It's garbage. Yeah. So Dude, I, that's it. I got to tell you guys, I had a um, little bit of a shock uh, over the weekend. A little shocking on. A little bit of a surprise. What's that? Okay. So I knew I've, I've been putting on a little bit of weight mm. recently. <laughs> You know, I'm just you're eating like a horse. This I'm weekend, just feeling, dude. I'm impressed. feeling, uh, you know, just just bigger. You know what I mean? Yeah. And I feel strong. I'm strong. I haven't been this strong in a long time. Feeling bigger, and uh, I'm like, ah, you know, I know I'm over 200 pounds, and I typically walk around. So as long as you guys have, we've worked together, 190 something, I, I, between 189, yeah. 188 at the low, to like 195, 196 at the high. That's just where it fluctuates. And I'm like, I know I'm over 200 pounds. I got to be over uh, at least 201, 202. Nah, dude, it was 209. Whoa. Yeah, was, <laughs> Whoa, yeah, beefcake. Bro, yeah. Bro, it was, uh, bro, you can't. Are you down hey, with the thickness? You can't use your little formula on me anymore, dude. What? You used to, used to use that a lot, pound for pound stronger so that if I passed uh -oh. you in a thing, you'd be uh -oh. like, well, I'm like 190. What are you? <laughs> yeah. Where we're about three pounds off of each other yeah, right now, dude. Man. I'm just going to be big, the bigger guy, I guess. <laughs> 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 New goal, huh? No, dude. You know, so you know, I, I weighed myself. So I went to a wedding um, with Jessica over the weekend. Her her cousin got married. Great, great dude, by the way. Great wedding. And um, I put on a suit that I. It's my suit. You know, I have one suit that I wear because I never wear suits. So it's like this is what I wear for weddings. I got it dry cleaned. I hadn't wear worn it for five or six months, and I put on the pants, and <laughs> the the they were short. So like I'm standing there and you can see my socks a little bit. So I'm like, I'm gonna get taller. And I realized like, oh, it's because my ass and my quads are lifting the freaking pants. It was just tight. It was Glute just tight pants. around my cakes. Yeah. yeah. You know, I felt like Justin. Hey. I was walking around with the Justin <laughs> Justin Walker <laughs> this or whatever. That's what it I mean. feels like. Yeah. I've been giving you the good game pat. Y you quite know a what? Bit lately. Back in the day, um, I up until probably I wanna say seven, eight years ago, six, seven, eight years ago, I used to every winter, I used to, I would call it beefcake season, and I will bulk up to 220, 225. I used to do this every su every single winter. And then every summer, I'd cut down to like 190, I never, 192. I was always off on that. I, you uh, would bulk up in the yes, summer? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> just it just worked out that way. It was never, you know what I'm saying? I always told myself that I'm, I'm going to bulk in the winter, get cut and shredded in the summertime, and just for whatever reason, whatever was going on in my life at that time, that it just didn't work out that yeah, way. I yeah. ended up the opposite. So no, I, was, I, used, I think my my best shape I've ever been in my life, for some reason, has always fallen in the winter for some no, reason. No, dude, I, I, just, I used to get heavy in the winter, and i do it on purpose. I'd follow the whole bulking, cutting thing, which is all baloney. 
Um, and what, what had, the reason why I haven't done that for so long, first off, it's not effective. You don't need to push your body that much. Uh, some bulk and some cut, sure, and keep them short. But the long, you know, extended where I'm getting up to 220. And I, I don't have a huge bone frame. So 220 on me is like, it's like 240 on you, for example. Right. Um, it's, it's just it's just too much weight. But, you know, because my gut health tends to be always in or out, and so I can't push food that much, mm. but it's been good for a long time now. So that's why you guys saw me mm -hmm. over the weekend eating because I don't have that. You're, you're actually mad at us for not stopping to eat. I know. I, was <laughs> like, I don't know what's happening. I, was, I, was I hope I don't get back up to He's two. He's a hungry boy. 220. You guys don't yeah. want to see my round. I just wanted, to, face I just wanted to get home, bro. We did... We, what, did we leave Wednesday or Thursday, Doug? Was it Wednesday or Thursday? We left on Wednesday evening? Yeah, Wednesday night. Wednesday, yeah, we night. drove Wednesday night you know, to get up there. Thursday, we looked at, what, uh, nine houses or ten mm -hmm. houses? Mm -hmm. uh, so drove all over South Lake, North Lake, Incline Village, Truckee area, all on Thursday. Friday, we hit, what, two or three properties, plus talk to the realtor stuff. Drove all over again, Incline Village and stuff. Then hit the road Friday, drove all the way back to San Jose. Hit a little bit of traffic, but you know, sitting in the car again all day long from nine a.m. all day. Get get to San Jose finally. I come home, I unpack the bag from Tahoe, shower really quick, pack the bag up, kiss Max, kiss Katrina, get out the door again, drive back the direction that I, we just came from to go to my buddy's place in Lodi, which is another two and a half, well, with traffic on Friday, a good three hours plus of sitting in traffic oh. head back there. Get there at like 10 o'clock or so at night, say hi to him, talk to him for a little bit, hit the sack, back up at 5 a.m., <laughs> head to uh, the Delta Sack River area and drop in the boat there, fish, all day, all day long on the on the boat and sun and doing that Jeez. thing, and then drive back to. Oh man, you're pretty Jeez. energetic. No, today. just stop there. And then we get. Home, I get back that night, late that night. Crash. Get up early in the morning again, and we go for a hike out at um, Los Altos Hills. I forget the name of the, the trail that Katrina likes to go there. I forgot that that was planned. That she wanted to take his photos up there and, and do we did this lot with their kids and so now all three of us have our kids and we did this it was like a trip I'll tell you something dude going on a hard going on a large a long trip and not getting good sleep and now is going to have a different meaning for you now that you have a kid cuz it's like you come home oh yeah and it's not like you but when you don't have kids you don't what, catch up yeah anymore. yes exactly what happens <laughs> when you come home and you don't have kids you're like oh cool i get to Go to sleep, take naps. No, nope, come home. Got to take care of the kids. Got to stay up. Oh, yeah. oh, so I you came. Be super dad. It was. I came home, and of course, and I know this, right? So you know, I know that Katrina. Like this is the longest I went without seeing Max. So going two days in a row, not seeing him, then seeing him for like five minutes before I went out the door again, and then be gone again for a, a day and a night. So that was the longest stretch. So there was a part of me too. I couldn't wait to get hold, get home course, and hold him. Yeah. But I'm so exhausted, right? So I take him right after his bath time, which we kind of settle him down and get ready for bed. And uh, Katrina comes upstairs, and she wakes wakes me up, and I'm I've got one leg up on the bed, the other one's on the floor like this, and I was rocking him, and I had laid down for a second, and oh. pa passed out, oh, yeah, wow. yeah, like leg on the floor, leg up on the bed, sitting halfway up with him in my arms, and she comes over and she wakes me up, and she's like, "Hey, are you awake?" And I'm like, oh, "What? What? what? <laughs> get, get, get up, put him in the bed, and." Man, that was a that's tire. a long one, dude. Yeah. I'll tell you what, dude. That whole um, Tahoe area is just I love it up there. It's oh, the it's, best. Oh, it's my favorite. And I'm just happy that we all feel the same way about that. Yeah, yeah I know. It's it's super important, it, it, you know. And uh, and this is a lesson that I didn't learn until much later. So if you're a young entrepreneur, this may be something you want to you want to think about is you know when you have a business it's so you can be so busy that unless you schedule time and make it a priority to have time where you're where you unplug it's not going to happen now people ask what's the value of that because you think to yourself like oh I, you know i just need to work i just want to be busy all the time well the value is you're fresh the value is it re it maintains and spurs creativity mm -hmm. it keeps your innovation it keeps things in perspective, so it's really it's a really important thing. So for us, going up there, potentially finding a place that we can all go up and go away, and then scheduling. Here's a big thing for me. That's why I sent you that long text after we got back. I, I want I want I want your kids to know me 
uh, like family. I want to know your kids like family. I want the same thing for my children. I think it's mm-hmm. super, super important, and it'll just cre- it'll foster a bond um, between all of our families that I think will benefit everybody's lives, but then also benefit the business. It'll make us just better at what we do, and we have to have it. We have to have it scheduled, and it's not going to happen on accident for yeah. sure. Yeah, it's never going to. Oh, happen I learned I, I learned that lesson with just Katrina and I in our relationship. I think I talked about this on the show not that long ago. Where you know, we we made this deal in our relationship. Um, I don't know if this was probably five years ago. You know, Katrina's. We've been together now for nine, over nine years now. Uh, in that time, she has seen me start and build three different businesses, and uh, I can get very myopic when I decide I'm going to put my brain to something and like that's what I want to focus on to the to a to a fault. Right? I mean, that's I would consider that a strength of mine. But it's also a detriment when it talk when you talk about other people that are affected by that. And so, you know, I remember us having our first like rocky parts of our relationship years and years back. And what, what I mean, rocky, like her and I just never disagreed or really fought ever. We had such we have such a great relationship and understanding. But the things that would probably start to wear on her is that my desire to work all the time. And something that I said to her that listen, if you ever feel this way and you feel like I'm not paying enough attention to you or you feel I'm distracted all the time or all I'm doing is working, you have control of everything. You have all the accounts. You have my schedule. You have all access to all of that. You just fucking, you put a weekend in there and you just book it out. Like, you know, don't don't stand for it longer than a couple more weeks. Mm -hmm. Schedule us. So still to this day, I'll open up my calendar sometimes and have not looked ahead two or three weeks and then all of a sudden it comes up to that week and I'm like, what the hell? Why am I blocked off? For these three days, and then she'll tell me, "Oh, we're going here, or we're doing this." You have to do it, man. No. Yeah. You have I mean, it's to. Important. It's important. Makes a world of a difference it, in our relationship. So I compare it to um, to working out. Like, you know, how, how many times did you have a client that was a an executive or an entrepreneur, a business person, and you try to talk to them about the value of exercise? And they'll say things like, I just don't have time. I work 12 hours a day. I'm busy. But then when you finally, if you do a good job, if you do a good job and you convince them to do it for long enough, then they start to see the value. And what do they always tell you? I'm more productive. Yeah. I'm more effective. I remember the first time this happened to me. I had a, a, a client that I trained who was an a older gentleman, very, very successful uh, self-made uh, businessman. And he came to me to, to train him. His wife actually told him he had to start getting training because he had some doctor's appointments that weren't so great. And it's so funny, three months into the training, and he comes in and he goes, I got some feedback for you. And I, so I, I think he's going to say to me like, oh, man, I look better, I'm stronger, you know, I'm leaner. Mm-hmm. And he's like, I'm, I've never been so good in my meetings to my staff. Mm. I'm like, what? And he yeah. goes, yeah, he goes, it's because of the workouts. Because of the workouts, because I feel better, because I get that time to myself, when I have my meetings, I'm way more effective. He goes, I'm doing way better in business. And I knew that when he said that to me that he would never stop working out. And shoot, to this day, yeah. he's now 81. I still see him in, on social media. He still exercises. Because yeah. for him, he found that value in, in the workouts. That you know same what, I mean? uh, what saying applies, I guess, the trading dimes for quarters, right? Yes. So you're, you do have to compromise a bit because, yes, like your schedule is super slammed and booked. Like everything business, you're going to cram in there. But now you wedge in something that's going to make you uh, even more productive later. Uh, you know, initially you might have a little bit of a drop in in productivity, but you're going to gain so much more. This is why I think, uh, why I value having a, a gym in my garage so much. Yeah. Right here. Because it reduces all the non, uh, you, you know, workout time, like the, the time it takes to drive to the gym, right. the time it takes to get your bag and get all ready and all that shit or whatever. I can work out in my garage Whenever I want, I can wake up in the morning, don't even need to brush my teeth or anything. I can go out there and work mm-hmm. out my underwear if I want to, which I do sometimes. And I go out and just do my workout whenever. And it keeps me, it just removes all the potential obstacles. That's the thing. Like, what you want to do is you want to eliminate all the, all the potential obstacles that come up in, in your way. So an obstacle would be like, oh, I got to, I, I, you know, I'm going to go home and then I got to go back to the gym. Mm-hmm. Like, that's an obstacle. So maybe you just go straight to the gym from work. That helps a lot of people. No, access whenever. Yeah, that oh, it's been a game changer for me. Totally. Just, just to be able to go downstairs and then keep, 
you know, like, like going one exercise at a time, just, even if it's just, I got to go bench and then I'll do like a few reps. Do you do that very often? All the time. Do you really? Yeah. I, that's, that's what, actually the most so effective segmented. way to work out. It's yeah. like, yeah. And I've noticed myself doing this more frequently lately, like the last two months or so where I'll just take one lift. I have it set up and ready to go. Courtney gets mad. Cause it's like, I don't put the weights away. You know, I'm like, <laughs> this is my gym. You know, I'll do what I want. Uh, but I, you know, I, I, I do that specifically on, on a lift or like a, you know, trap bar deadlift. I'll have it like set up and ready to go. And so I'll go down there, do some reps and I'll hit those reps maybe like five, six times, uh, you know, throughout the day. And that's what I think I would do if I had one in my house. Dude, I would do the same thing. And or, it's a lot of volume. Yeah. It's all, remember no, it when adds I, up. Remember when I did those experimental all day workouts? Well, it's funny that we, we assume that you, and I think for the most part, a lot of people do this. They, they block off and I would for it's scheduling. for convenience. Right. For convenience and scheduling purposes, it makes sense to block hours off every single you know day that you plan to work out and then you go to your gym or where whatever. But mm -hmm. if I had like a PRX set up like you do in your house, like your place, I would set it up to where I just come in there, do one exercise or two exercises and then go out and then come back and go out and come back. I would love to do that. And Dude, I, on, especially on weekends when I'm there all day long, that would be the, the most convenient actually even for me to do it that there's way. There's a lot of freedom with that mentality too because it's like, you know, you could just on a whim because that those opportunities, it's like you think they won't happen very often. They happen all the time. Mm -hmm. It's just like, okay, there's nothing going on. I'm going downstairs. I'll be right back up. Yeah, well, the, 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 the turnoff, I think, for people with the home gym or the reason the, the objections I would often hear from people is, well, if I have it at home, I'm not going to do it. And the reason why they think this way, it's false, by the way, it's not true. Uh, actually, statistically, if you look at uh, consistency with people who have access to something at home versus people who have to go somewhere, when you look at total use, uh, the amount of times people work out uh, is higher when they have access at home. Now, the reason why people have a false belief that they're, that they're less likely is because they're comparing when I'm at the gym, I know I need to work out. When I'm at home, I can do other stuff. Well, when you count and factor in the fact that you're probably not going to get to the gym. Mm -hmm. Sure, if you're at the gym, you're going to work out. But now factor in the fact that you're probably not going to want to drive to the gym. Mm -hmm. how, how easy is it to make an excuse to not drive your ass to the gym? So statistically speaking, if you have something accessible at home, the odds of, of, of you exercising are much higher because you're eliminating obstacles. It's just And that, that if you think of it that way, um, it makes perfect sense. As far as the workouts are concerned, Adam, all-day workouts – the most effective workouts I've ever done. It's inconvenient for a lot of different reasons. You got to be going in and out all the time. But if you're doing stuff at home, no. But I mean, like that's my Saturday. I guess dad life, especially now, right? Saturdays and Sundays are the days of getting caught yes. up from the week, right? I'm laundry's getting done. I'm washing the vehicles. I'm mm -hmm. straightening up the house, fixing whatever needs to be fixed. Like it's just a, a long day of that. Anyways, if I'm in town, that's kind of what my Saturday or Sunday looks like. And so if, if I could actually set it up to where, and I, I guess the only reason why I haven't done it yet is because th we were only supposed to be at this house temporarily for maybe a year or so. And I may only be there for another, you know, 10 months. So that's the only reason why I haven't set myself up the same way both of you have, because mm -hmm. I get it and I can see the, especially now being a dad, I totally see the value mm -hmm. of that, having that access whenever I want to Plus go Plus you're, you're so consistent. Obviously you're not going to stop your workouts, but I'll tell you what, dude, when you hop in and out of doing sets throughout the day, because I do this when I write. So if I'm writing like a big, like a, one of our guides or whatever, I'll pop in and out of the garage and do a set here and there, but I'll track the sets. Yeah. And I end up doing two or three times the volume yeah. that I would do in my regular workouts. Oh, but imagine. because it's so spread out, it doesn't hammer my body the same. And I swear to God, yeah. I, every time I do that, I swear to God, I see, I see get changes in my body. Plus, it's a mood-altering thing, oh, right? Yeah. So, like, if I'm ever, like, in a feisty mood, and Corinne's like, go downstairs. You know, <laughs> like, she's just like, go, you know, work it out. Yeah. And it, I really do. Like, I need that. Like, yeah. I, need, I need to work it out. The, the other objection is the cost, because buying equipment is really expensive up front, but buying a membership is usually, you know, 60, 50 bucks a month, 70 bucks a month or whatever. Yeah. But the equipment, man, PRX now has a, a monthly option. No. So you can get their equipment. Pay monthly, but now you have your own gym. Yeah, it's like nothing, but now all of a sudden, you know, you just bought your own gym. Yeah, and to be honest with you, I depending on the kind of workouts that I do, because I go to gyms too. I'll I'll, I'll go to a gym uh, at the moment two days a week, maybe one or two days a week, and then I'll do one to three days a week at home, depending on the week. But I'll tell you what, dude, my you want when I want to lift heavy and I mm -hmm. want to get after it and mm -hmm. be just 
chalk and just loud, you know, and just beefcake workouts. So right now I'm working out more in my garage. Yeah. It's more, oh yeah. It's more of the beefcake style workouts. If you guys start watching Halloween movies or anything to get you into the I spirit of things or anything. Stuff. I, I love, love those. Oh, that's right. Yeah, you're all against like horror movies. Such a pussy. Yeah. Did you guys did you see that did you <laughs> see that meme that I think it's uh who is it Kara that put it on our forum that did the meme of the the friends that you watching the guy who's got this, his hands covering over his eyes and the scary horror. <laughs> yeah. It's that time of year where you bring your friend who doesn't like watching scary yeah. movies. So she tagged me you in corner it. Corner him. Yeah. yeah. So I'm excited because that is me. My son's 14 now, so now he's like, it's cool to watch some scary. I'm not going to put the disturbing ones on, but I was going to say, what's the level you go now? Well, I'm going to watch Sixth Sense with him. I think okay. that's appropriate, okay. right? Yeah, that's it's, not bad. It's kind of he's yeah. got a nice twist at the end, so yeah, that'll be good. It's freaky. Do you have like Halloween well, movies that you watch every year? Only because like so, Courtney's big thing is always been hocus pocus which is like the cheesiest oh, like yeah. you know bet midler or whatever i think is oh, like one yeah. of the witches <laughs> it's like a comedy yeah it is it's, it's so cheesy <laughs> it's actually hokey. scarier than you think though but uh, you know Not she grew up kids. with it has all this like memories with it and stuff and so like we got the kids to watch it with her and so we're sitting on the couch we're watching you know this this cheesy movie and popcorn or whatever and uh, there's this part where, like, so he has to he has to light this candle, and he lights this candle, and the whole thing is the the witches won't come unless a virgin lights the candle. Oh yeah, right. And so he lights the candle, and then they're kind of like making fun of him throughout this whole movie that he's a virgin. And then so the kids pick up on this, and they're like, "Dad, what's a virgin?" <laughs> I'm like, "Dude, they're six and nine. Like, I don't feel like it's red. Like, it's time for me to like you know, have that, the sex. How talk. is that conversation, bro? Would you I, say somebody who's never been married before? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I said like I was like basically I was like people who aren't parents. <laughs> people and are, they're, they're and gonna so, go around pointing so out immediately they raise it like i'm a virgin dad i'm a virgin <laughs> i'm like all right let's calm down like <laughs> like don't go around town saying that all loud you know like it's like let's, let's just move on and they're just like oh, i'm a virgin so it's like the latest joke now is just like go into a room and say they're a virgin <laughs> now, you're, you're oldest, i didn't i didn't win on that one i didn't do a good job your oldest is nine yeah. Nine. So you're like two, three years, two years away from talking about sex. Yeah. That's when it starts to come up. At 11? Bit. Like 11, 12. Really? Yeah. I mean, for a boy? Yeah. I mean, they kind of know how babies are made. Yeah. But well, hold like, on. What grade is he in? Is he fourth? Uh, what? Yeah. He's in fourth? Oh, I guess. Fifth, fifth grade, bro. Yeah, fifth grade is fifth sex and sixth grade. Wow, yeah. you are right. So I had the conversation. No, he's in third. So that seems so early now. Then I think oh, back. shit. I got to have this conversation Wait, with my no, daughter. He's in fourth. Yeah. I'm going to be talking about this with my daughter soon. Okay. Well, Good luck here, with that one. Here we go. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Nah, that's not a problem. You know what you do, dude? I tell you what. Because I, I thought about it. I'm like, oh my God. Because my parents didn't say shit about sex with me. Oh, yeah. I didn't Nothing. learn from my parents. Are you kidding me? No. You know, the first time I heard the word sex on my mom was yeah. after I got married. And then all of a sudden, yeah. she thinks she could talk about sex with me. I'm like, it's too late, mom. Yeah. I don't want to hear talking about sex. I learned sex. from our teacher. She had, I remember it vividly. She had like this like huge perm. It was like a fro, but she had like really big, you know. Anyways, <laughs> it was really distracting. I didn't li like listen very well, but that's where I learned sex. Oh, was, man. So with my son, what I did was is I was just very frank, just very straight up and honest. So I said, oh, you know, I know you're learning this in school and here's how uh, babies <laughs> here's are made. the mechanics. No, you just say, is there, yeah. here's how babies are And you're just honest. You say yeah. uh, the, uh, a man... And you just the tell him. The train goes into the canal. No, Woo -woo. no, no. Just be straight up. He puts his <laughs> yeah. penis in the vagina, and then, uh, you know, then sperm goes in there, and, hey, and you talk, and then they'll ask you a question, and just be cool about it. And then my son yeah. was asking me questions like, yeah. how did you get it in there? I'm like, well, <laughs> <laughs> I think if you'll be able to figure yeah. it out. When he, wants to, do, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. When he wants to do it, this is what happens. She'll help you, don't worry. Yeah. 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 <laughs> when the time comes, she'll yeah. help you out. But you gotta, might need you, some extra hands. I don't you, know. You know why? You don't want him to figure it out from his buddies or the internet. You, know you definitely saying? don't. Because yeah, that's how I learned shit. Let well, that's why I was a little worried. Like, he's just going to go to his friends and be like, a virgin is this. And, you know, we're <laughs> My dad says sex. I'm a virgin. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, shit. Are you a virgin? Yeah. The guy's like, no. Hey, did you guys hear what happened in Chicago? <laughs> no. No. They decriminalized all psychedelic plants. Oh, in shit. Chicago? Yeah. Dude, I'm So they're following city. the same, uh, what town was it? Oakland. Yeah. So remember how Oakland did that? Yeah. yeah. Dude, little by little. I, the, the war on wow, drugs. that's interesting. We are going to, this is the beginning of the end of the war on drugs. It started with marijuana. Dude, sorry, Nancy Reagan. It started with marijuana. Yeah. Now it's moving to psychedelic plants. It's going to eventually move down the list. And what we're going to end up seeing, mark my words, are looser and looser uh, regulations. I don't think they're all going to be regulated the same. But looser and looser regulations. Uh, I think I still think distributing uh, and you know trying to sell is going to be very strict uh, regulations um, and laws. 
But I think self and personal use were, this is the beginning of reduced sentences and just the way we treat people who don't hurt anybody but themselves. I think this is a very, very good thing. Ah, yeah, that's yeah, exciting. Kind of, kind of interesting, right? Yeah. And you know, Mexico's taken their stance. Their stance seems to be moving in the opposite direction mm. because of all the, the, the insanity of their... Did you know that one... How's that affecting the cartel relationship with the people and everything? Well, dude, I, I just I just saw this the other day. What what was that town in Mexico? Juarez, I think it was. That mm. was the, the one where there was all those those drug cartels or whatever. Juarez. There's is, that, a, is that what Breaking Bad is, is, is in? No. Is it Albuquerque. Oh, Albuquerque. <laughs> Yeah. yeah, a little different. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. But in I think it was Juarez, if I'm not mistaken, somebody was getting murdered every hour. It's not a huge town. Wow. There was that's how many people were getting. It was like straight up wars over there with the cartels. Damn. Like the the cops are afraid to do anything. Wasn't well, it one point. of you guys when we were in Tahoe that was talking about someone got kidnapped? One of the major drug dealers' kids' son got kidnapped or something. Oh, I don't oh, know about this. Know. Yeah. Oh, you, maybe Doug said that. Did, well, it was. I thought it was you guys that told me that. Maybe it was my my buddies when I was fishing with them. It's all it's like ground. It's all blurred. It's one fucking long <laughs> day for me. It's my <laughs> other friends. Dude, it's I, my I, other friend Justin. Brother. That's yeah, like when you're like we were up there and uh, no, so, who big, got the pizza last night? I was like, what was it? You? Neither one of us. None of us. Yeah, it was your other friend. Look this up. I'm pretty sure that one of the major drug lords' son got kidnapped. Oh, there he is. Yeah, it's a it's a big deal right now. So what? I thought that's what you were talking about. Opportunistic fraudsters. Yes, there you go. El, El Chapo's Chapo son's son. arrest in a bid, a bid to steal Bitcoin? Huh? The capture of El Chapo's son. So I think his son was arrested. Uh, is that what? It, oh, maybe his son was arrested, and then the, there was crazy amount of retaliation and gangs like fighting each other over him being arrested and I think they were had to release him because it was getting so crazy. How Dang. fucked up is that? The cops release you. Yeah. Oh my gosh. I thought for sure you guys that's what yeah, you I didn't it was see you. that. Uh -uh. Yeah, my buddy was just telling me this is recent. Look, it's 5 hours ago, 2 days ago. Dude, I'm telling you right now, here's the here's the thing. We need to all we need to as humans, we need to face the reality. There are markets for things and sometimes the markets are so strong that trying to ban them only causes more problems. So People using drugs and abusing drugs, not a good thing. Trying to make them illegal makes it worse. You know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. There's just markets that you can't, that you, it's like you got to accept at some point, like, okay, people are going to do drugs. So what's the best approach here? Because this crazy, uh, <laughs> these crazy laws are causing a lot of children to be raised without fathers and they're, you're, you're creating a very vibrant black market. And in the black market, people settle disputes. Not through lawyers and courts, yeah, but 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 through you know violence because Strong that's the, that's yeah. the only way to do it. So anyway, super crazy. Oh, another crazy article I read: creatine, the nutri the, the supplement that does it all. Yeah, also may actually help fight cancer. What? Yeah, yeah. Scientists studied uh, the T cells that go after cancer cells and kill cancer cells. Wow! And they found that when those T cells were not uh, when they didn't have enough creatine, they weren't nearly as effective. And so they speculated that having adequate creatine levels could make your T-cells more effective at getting rid of cancer. Because, you know, creatine... It replenishes oh, your crazy. energy. ATP, right. which is mm -hmm. right. one of the main sources of energy in the body. Mm -hmm. So that makes sense. But that also, would it be like one of those situations too that in the wrong environment could promote it? Uh, that's a very, very good question. Um, because but, I, I, I would think that that makes sense for fighting it for a, for a healthy person, but then maybe somebody who has it taking it would also fuel the cancer, I would think. That's a very, very good question. Um, cells need more than just creatine for energy. They need glucose and amino acids and um, and ketones sometimes. So, uh, But that's a, that's a very interesting question. Um, but what they speculated was no, the opposite, that you, you want to have adequate creatine so that your T cells can can always go around and get rid of you know potential cancer. So is cells it also them. considered an antioxidant? Can, uh, creatine. Yeah, it's got some antioxidant properties. Right. Uh, for the heart, dude. I'm telling you right now, creatine There's is a lot more to it. Than creatine me. is the next yeah. big wellness supplement. Yeah, I'm, I'm gonna say that right now. It's been for a long time performance. It's, it's been all about mm -hmm. first of all, it's about bodybuilding, muscle building. Then it was oh, just pure performance. <laughs> then it was oh, it's good for cognitive benefits and boost. But I, I guarantee you creatine is going to start to be marketed as an all-around wellness supplement. I don't there, see how it can't be with yeah. this movement right now with veganism, too. Uh, like I, I figure know. that the whole if, Game Changers if, documentary. Right, th those people are going to benefit probably the most from it. Totally. So I would imagine that there's definitely going to be a push on it. Totally. Time to invest in your, your creatine supplement. Uh, no, it's it's. I, I think it's 
pretty interesting and pretty rad. It's like the one supplement that actually works. Yeah, <laughs> I does, know. And it does everything. Right. You there know what I mean? If I was going to recommend any supplement, it would be, aside from a nutrient that you may need, it would be creatine. So, And then uh, last article, I got one more I wanted to mention to you guys. I read this interesting article in New York Times. Um, but there were these scientists and experts trying to explain what makes somebody charismatic, which mm. I thought was a very interesting article. Mm-hmm. Like they're trying to break down. Wait, what do they tease out? I mean, what, yeah, what are, well, no, that's so that's the, that's the question because they were saying how it's so difficult. Like you can have two completely different people. Like you could have an entertainer, then you could have like a person like Elon Musk, or you could have hmm. a comedian, or you could have someone that's on TV, a villain or a good guy. Both of which are considered charismatic, even though one is like someone you like, one is someone that you hate. Hmm. And they define. Charisma, like magnetism. Yes, they define charisma as you want to be around this person. This person makes you feel better, and you want to hear what they have to right. say. Hmm. And so there are a few different things that they that they uh, narrowed it down to. But the one thing that they had in common were that all charismatic people, as far as they could tell, were excellent storytellers. Mm-hmm. They were very good at using analogies and metaphors and at telling stories. And they and they said that charisma. A lot of times, people believe it to be <coughs> something that you're born with, but they said, no, if you learn how to tell good stories and you learn how to listen really well and make people feel like they're the only person in the room when you talk to them and you use good metaphors and analogies, you'll dramatically improve the your level of charisma. Mm-hmm. And in my opinion, the that likability, that charisma likability, that's a skill that'll benefit uh, anybody. It'll yeah. make you more money. It'll make you more better in your marriage. It'll anything make you better. You totally. Anything that you do. I agree. How interesting is that? That is really yeah. interesting. Yeah. First question is from Parker Glessner 6.6. Despite you guys not loving machines, what is your favorite machine and why? Mm. I think we need to clear Ooh. that up first. Yeah, we do. It's not that we don't like machines. Uh, machines have a lot of value when you um, inject them into you a, a well-planned and programmed workout. It's just the reliance on machines or the, uh, that's all I do is machines, uh, is, it tends to be the problem. Um, free weights, I mean, a couple different reasons why free weights are better um, overall. Free weights form to the body. Machines, your body has to form to the machine. Uh, machines are typically designed for someone who's about average height, mm. average limb length. Even though the seats adjust and the arm lengths adjust, you get a tall guy like Adam on there, uh, or somebody who's a little bit shorter like Doug, and some machines just don't work well for them at all. And I used to encounter this with clients. I put them on a machine, and it just didn't line up well with them. The other thing is that uh, free weights tend to – some of the best exercises you could ever do for your body are the free weight ones. I have yet to see a deadlift machine, um, a squat machine. There's very few that are I would even put in the same category as a squat. Yeah. That being said, adding machines um, can be v- beneficial. Machines. Yeah, they have their value. Mm-hmm. But yeah, when you're in a fixed position and and you know you have like these machines that you're on a track, you can only get really good at going on that specific track. And so you know the carryover for me has always been not quite as substantial as you know me doing that same exercise, but now having a lot more variables attached because it's it that's just more things to consider when I have to move in multiple directions. Right. And now adding frequency and volume and changing the angles. Machines can be awesome. If you see me working out in a gym, because I usually work out in my garage and my garage is mainly free weights. If you see me in a gym, you'll see me using mostly machines. And a lot of that is because I just don't have access to machines. So I like the the novelty. My body responds well to throwing them in um, every once in a while. When I have access to them, I use them quite a bit. As far as favorite machines are concerned, I mean, I have one machine that if I see it in the gym, I'm going to use it. The pullover machine. Love the pullover. Oh, yeah, yeah. Not a lot of gyms have them, I was wondering what you were going to say. Yeah, I haven't I seen like, that in that's, every gym. That's one, that's one machine that if I see it in a gym, I'm going to hunt I love it. I love the feel of it. It's better than a dumbbell pullover even. I don't know if I have a single one machine. I love machines and, and being a, the bodybuilder, one of us, uh, I mean, they were, I, they were used a lot. Um, I still, my, my core training was still, uh, free weights and compound lifts, but you know, I did a a lot of the auxiliary work. I did a lot of these, you know, focusing on little, little details and small muscle groups. Uh, so I, I think I have probably a favorite machine for, I, there's not a lot of gyms. Okay. So I'll go Sal's direction, like a, a rare one to see, or I get really excited. I love, and, and I'm so pissed. In fact, 
the gym that I go to on a regular basis got rid of this machine, and there's a rear delt fly machine that you lay face down. Oh, I know what you're talking about. Oh, that's a great one. I fucking love that machine. Mm -hmm. uh, and you know, and why I'm, I'm partial to that because rear delts were a, a major focus of mine when I was competing. It really, just brought out my back and my my shoulders. And there's not a lot of machines uh, that are uh, designed uh, for the rear delts at all. And that was a phenomenal machine. Would you guys can, can you can you say that a cable exercises are machines, or is that out of the out of the category? Uh, I would consider it a machine. Uh, you know, like a free motion cable machine. Like, I mean, because it's all. I mean, the thing about that though is it gives you a lot of uh, angles. Well, mm -hmm. if, if you were going to use that, then I would have to. That is because if you or if you were going to use that as uh, listing what we think is our favorite, I use a, a free. Yeah, I'll motion. probably use that the most. Yeah, I use a free motion cables the most cables because you can do so much. Yeah, like it. a low pulley row is a staple in in a, in a back workout. A lat pull down. Tends to be a staple um, in a workout. Yeah. Um, so cables, if you put cables in there. Oh, I and, love cables. And when I train clients, if I put a client on a machine, and if we're considering cables machines, 99% of the time it was cables. 99% mm -hmm. of the time. That yeah. was the machine that I would put another, on. Another great, and I don't know if this falls in this category, um, I like the seated row, uh, I mean, excuse me, the T-bar row mm -hmm. uh, chest support machine yeah and the reason why i like that is because i deadlift so much and sometimes my low back is a little fried from deadlifting but i still want to hit my hit my back and keep the frequency up mm -hmm. and so an exercise like that lends itself really well because i can still load it good i can still train my back really hard but then i'm not i'm not crushing my erector spinae you, at all you know it's another good machine that you never see anymore and i know uh i think you've, you you and i have talked about this before adam i think this was a favorite of yours too the lateral machine where it was – there were metal arms and there were handles that you held oh, with your yeah, hands. Yeah. And it was like a circular cam and you yeah. came out and did yeah. laterals. Yeah. That one – I don't know why I don't see those. I think because people don't know how to use it. But I love that yeah, for probably. shoulders. Absolutely I, one of my favorites. I still – I love the reverse hyper. I consider that a machine uh, even though like it's plate loaded and, you know – but to me like I get such a great feeling, you know, all the way up the back. My entire posterior chain I can I can feel get involved with that exercise. So I, I'll, I'll supplement with that every now and then, you know, in between deadlifts, in between good yeah. mornings. Yeah, I think, like I think we could all go down the rabbit hole here yeah. of, of – machines are great. I think the reason why we've made that point on this show um and that's why i wanted to clear it up before we went on this tangent of like that we've all started on different there's a lot of favorite machines and machines have a, a definitely value the problem is it a lot of pe the average person that that is either listening to this show or that we would train gravitates towards machines in fear of training free weights and compound lifts and they don't have they don't right. spend a lot of time in the gym the average person is going to work out Two to three days a week, forty-five minutes to an hour, and uh, if when you don't have a whole lot of time, you want to do the most effective, best, most functional exercises, and that's free weights. Now, if you're in the gym five days a week, and you're hitting every body part two, three times a week, and you're doing all these different exercises, well, now machines have a lot more value. Now you're looking for more angles. You're looking for different types of tension on you're, the muscle. You're looking at hitting certain muscle groups and not exhausting another side, like the example yep. I gave the T-bar rows. So you're trying to complement your comp. So that's I like machines to complement all the big compound lifts. I wouldn't. I, where we hate machines, or I think we talk out on them a lot, is replacing them with those. Don't ever don't. And that's mm. why we have to be careful when we explain stuff like this, where we talk about the value and how great this machine is or that machine is. It's not great if it replaces. Uh, a, a good free weight exercise or a lot of the, the free weight or compound lifts that we talk about on the show. It's incredible. They're incredible to complement all those movements. So no matter what your favorite machine is, even like a dumbbell pullover, well, dumbbell pullover is great and Sal loves that machine, but I guarantee it's not great in replace of a deadlift no. or a row. No. no, Those are staple movements. That's a great tool or a great thing to incorporate to complement the big, the big compound. Lifts. Totally. Next question is from JP94. How do I grow my traps? Oh, good old good old traps. Grow them traps. You know, the most common exercise for traps is are shrugs, but I've I'm I've, I'm beginning to believe that shrugs are not the best exercise for the traps. And I I, I learned this because of uh, Map Strong. We wrote Map Strong. There were two exercises in there that I'd done before, 
but that I didn't do in regular rotation. I'd throw them in every once in a while, but I didn't do them consistently. The high pulls. High pull. The snatch grip high snatch pulls. Snatch grip uh, deadlift. It, yeah, snatch grip high pulls mainly, and uh, heavy farmer walks mm. uh, mm-hmm. with a trap bar. Man, I started doing those in my routine, and yeah. I did them regularly because in Map Strong they're they're in their weekly. I mean, if you want to blow your traps out, you should follow Map Strong. Yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah. That was I mean, when, it's centered around that. When we were, I remember when we were riding it with Robert Oberus. One of the things, and one of the ways that when we create a program like that, uh, a lot of it is us still steering the programming, but we ask a lot of questions from the athlete, like, you know, what are what are some favorite moves, or what have you found well? And one of the things that when we were like looking over a lot of the stuff that Robert was doing, all of us right away were like, God damn. A lot of upper back stuff here. Mm-hmm. I mean, you're, and he's like, yeah, no. It, I mean, for the lifts that you have to, do, and it makes sense. It makes sense why why he was doing a lot of that. And so that's part of what is unique to that program is we made sure to include. That's not something we would that high of that much volume in the upper back and trap area is probably not something we would do in a normal standard program. But because that is a supporting area for a lot of overhead pressing and lifting that they do, it's it's crucial. Mm-hmm. So if you're somebody who's interested in growing traps and you haven't followed MAP Strong, to me, that's got to be I'll a, a you, must in your rotation. I'll tell you what, traps is one of those muscle groups that, you know, when you see certain muscle groups really developed on a person, you 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 know, like, that's a strong... You know they're strong. Yeah, that's a yeah. strong person. Like, you see a lot of developed biceps. doesn't necessarily mean they're a strong person. You see a dude with developed traps... Usually it means they're pretty damn strong. It's just yeah. one of those body parts. And it really is an important muscle group. It stabilizes the entire shoulder girdle. Mm-hmm. The traps are very important for overhead presses and for rows and just for giving you strength in that upper back um, area. Um, traps, like any body part, respond well for most people if you train them about two to four times a week. So on average, about three days a week. They respond well to different rep ranges just like any other body part. Anywhere between low reps, three reps, to higher reps, maybe as high as 20. And they also respond really well to uh, different angles. Um, Shrugs, overhead shrugs, snatch grip, high pulls, and then tension movements like heavy farmer walks. Like when you're walking with really, really heavy dumbbells or a heavy trap bar and you're standing tall and maintaining good posture, because you're using so much weight, because when I did a trap bar, uh, you know, farmer walks. I, I got up to over 400 pounds. And although I'm not doing a shrug with that weight, just the simple fact that I'm supporting it mm-hmm. and staying stable with my upper traps and my upper back, I mean, they responded Well, like it's crazy. such a great contrast between that and then doing an explosive movement where you're getting that fast twitch response out of the muscle, which stimulates it completely different way. So now you get your your traps to, to develop, uh, you know, that both both directions. Yeah, I know what's funny about traps, too, is a lot of people get tight in their neck and, they you know, they'll, they'll, they get that tension. And a lot of times people think, well, don't work that area out because you're really tight. And I used to believe that. Um, now, now what I'm about to say isn't the opposite. I'm not saying go hammer the shit out of your traps if they if your neck gets tight, but some full range of mo- motion in that area actually reduces the tension and stress you feel in that area. So I would get clients who would have really tight trap areas, and I would work on correctional exercise for their shoulders and offset the overactivity of those muscles. But then I'd have them do some really light full range of motion shrugs, really, really light. Just let them come all the way down, let them squeeze all the way up. And they'd get all this relief in that area. So just because something's tight doesn't mean it's too strong. Sometimes it could be tight and weak. Oftentimes it could be tight and weak. Um, Now, I know a lot of women avoid training their traps. I think this is a mistake. Now, of course, there's an aesthetic component. If you're somebody that has really well-developed traps and you don't want them to get too big, I get it. But if you're a woman listening and you don't have really big trap muscles, don't be afraid of training your traps because you think you're going to wake up tomorrow looking like you know, like a power lifter. It's not going to happen. It takes a long time to develop any muscle, including the traps. Still train your traps because here's what's going to happen. It's going to make your mid-back look better. It's going to give you better posture if you train them properly. It's going to make your overhead presses stronger. It's a very important muscle for overhead presses. And if you want to develop good shoulders, you also need to have – strong supportive trap. So don't avoid trap training just because you think, oh, I don't want a big neck or whatever. Worst case scenario, you get to the point where you look in the mirror and you're like, okay, I think I'm happy where my traps are. Then you can really scale down, but it won't happen overnight. I wouldn't, I wouldn't freak out over it. Don't avoid the trap. Next question is from Mini Fig. 
When you hit a plateau with your deadlift, what exercises or techniques can you implement to help you overcome the plateau and increase the weight you're able to lift? So specific to the deadlift. Yeah, well, that, I'll tell. Well, I'll tell you what. This is hard when you don't know why they're plateauing. Yeah, you don't. We don't know why. So I'm going to give you some general answers that I think apply to a lot of people. Okay, one of the one thing that I did that made a big difference with my deadlift was when I started using bands uh, on my deadlift. Um, when I was able to get a platform, and you can do this without a platform too. It's just way more convenient and easier to do with, with a platform. I would have bands on either side of the, of the bar. So I'd load the bar with weight, have the bands. And then as I deadlift, uh, the bands, as you stretch bands out, they get tighter and tighter. So what ends up happening is at the bottom of the deadlift, it's pretty much whatever the weight is on the bar plus a little bit of extra resistance. But as I'm pulling it up, it gets harder and harder because the bands stretch out. So it's giving me this kind of variable resistance. And that alone added about 15 pounds uh, to my deadlift once I incorporated those. I noticed... And they just feel really good when you get up to the top and it's the heaviest at the top uh, uh, of the rep. So that's one thing that I did that, that really made a big difference. Another thing I did was uh, deficit deadlifts. This one mm -hmm. was really good. There's an easy way to do this, by the way. Some people like to stand on like 45-pound plates. Plate. Yeah, here's another easier way. Here's an easier way to do it. Use 35-pound plates. So now the bar's shorter. So now you have to get down lower to do your deadlift and then do your deadlift or use 25-pound plates. And start easy and go slow. This is an easy. This is a great way to hurt your back if you're not good at these. Um, or you can stand on a block or something like that. But those really, really low deadlifts, we have to squat down real low and come up. Those also transfer to to my my deadlift strength and my deadlift weight. I mean, without seeing or knowing too much about this person, the the first area that I would always go is to I would look at programming, like and assume that if you're like most people when they hit hard plateaus, it's a lot of times because their programming has been pretty similar. They've been following the same programming, whether that be the same types of exercises all the time. Or, mm -hmm. and, it, and if you're trying to work on your squat or your deadlift, I mean, uh, you're probably just deadlifting all the time. Some of the best things that you can do is, you know, if you go conventional all the time, go to sumo. sumo. If, yeah. you, if you're always – trap bar. If you're always strength training for, you know, three to five reps and chasing PRs, you know, try training eight to 12 reps and, and lightening the load up. Um, and then to Sal's point, messing with the strength curve by adding bands or chains um, are all great techniques or – uh, what Justin said, go to trap bar for a little bit. So, I mean, the, I always look first to programming when when someone tells me they're they're at a hard plateau. And then uh, another possibility uh, I know personally from chasing uh, PRs or trying to increase strength, uh, I was overtraining. So I would also assess that part of programming. Am I deadlifting so much that I'm not allowing my body to fully recover? Uh, and then come back to it. So you you may need to back off volume and maybe work more technique instead of going loading so heavy all the time. So it's really tough for these types of questions when we get like a very specific, what should I do? Yeah. Um, because it could be a very simple answer. I mean, if I looked at uh, your programming and saw something like that, where there's a big hole where it's like, oh yeah, well the last six months I've been training, you know, five by five, you know, consistently always training that way. Well, shit, let's, uh, let's jump to the eight to 10 rep range and, or let's do tempo and slow down uh, the tempo in this. Section. Oftentimes, when people hit a plateau with a lift, uh, I assume okay, if someone says to me, "I hit a plateau," okay, it means you've been focusing on this lift. This is an important lift for you. You've been trying to get stronger at it. That means you've probably pushed, 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 and you might need to back off a little bit. Right. Mm -hmm. And oftentimes, that that tends to be the key. Where if you're if you're always in the in the gym and you're always hitting you know 200 pounds on your deadlift or 300 pounds on your deadlift and you're pushing it, maybe cut the weight in half for a few weeks and just focus on speed and technique, speed or perfect form, mm -hmm. and do that for a little while, and then you'll find that your strength comes up. Here's another one with deadlifts that I noticed uh, both with myself and with clients. Uh, uh, if your squat goes up, your deadlift tends to also go up. It's, the alternate isn't always true. If my deadlift goes up, my squat doesn't always go up. So sometimes what I would do is I would back off on my deadlifts. I'd stop deadlifting as often or stop deadlifting as hard, focus just on my technique and my form, so I'm going lighter, and then push my squat a little bit and see how strong I can get in my squat. Then as my squat went up and I started feeling stronger, then I'd go back to deadlifting a little harder and I'd notice, oh, there's that, there's that boost in strength 
you know, that happen. Um, I know you mentioned the trap bar. Yeah, I mentioned the trap bar mainly, uh, too, for changing up, uh, you know, the grip. And, and one of the things, too, for me that was always like uh, I would hit like a certain – amount to where I could get that, you know, pretty easily or not was my grip was the factor. And Your so petite hands. Yeah. My nice little like <laughs> dainty hands. Um, That's not true at all. Not at all. These are pretty rough, dude. Look at that. <laughs> um, but anyway, so I would, I would actually use again, the, uh, the farmer walks were great for me to just focus on, um, you know, sustaining, like getting in more grip endurance and being able to grind through and, and, you know, maintain that grip. I know that you switched up your grip, Sal, with, with, uh, the hook grip. And I was wondering at what point do you want to factor that in, in terms of like, okay, I can hit, I can hit this weight and there's basically a ceiling to this to where mm -hmm. I can grab, you know, with a conventional grip, you know, prone versus like now maybe I'll try, you know, a different technique completely and start all over. Yeah. No, I, I had to because I had deadlifted for so long with the alternate grip and it was like my heavy sets were all right hand, you know, facing up, left hand facing down. And I had actually developed an imbalance in my back. You know, a lot of people say, oh, it doesn't matter. No, it matters. You develop an imbalance. And so then I said, okay, I'm going to go to to con just both overhand and I'm going to work on a hook grip. You know what I noticed? When I went to a hook grip with both sides, you know what got really freaking sore on me? I think it was my brachialis muscle underneath mm. my bicep because it was pronated and I'm like handling so much weight. Mm. So it took me a year to work up to my normal weight with a hook grip. Now, to this day, my hook grip, is it's not quite where my, my alternate grip is. My alternate grip, I could still do probably... 10 to 15 pound more than my hook grip, but it's, it's damn close. And I get better, more balanced development. I would recommend everybody practice working on hook grip or if they use an alternate grip to alternate, to, to really alternate, don't do what I did where I alternated, but then when I went heavy, it was always the same side. Yeah. I would try and go overhand as far as I could go. Mm -hmm. And then that's when I would switch. Yeah. To, yeah but I like the, tra I like the trap bar a lot. I, I deadlifted 600 pounds on a trap bar about four months before I did it on a straight bar. And that's because I, I plateaued and I switched the trap bar exclusively and got my weight all the way up to 615, I think it was, uh, on a trap bar. Then I went back to the straight bar and I noticed I just felt stronger, more solid, and I was able to get it up to 600 pounds. So um, try all of those things one at a time on your routine and see if it if it kind of helps you out. Um, I, I, if I have to take a guess, I'd say you're probably, you, you're probably in store for some backing off, though, if I had to take a guess just from the way the question was was worded. Next question is from J.C. Kubak. What's one bad habit you're working on or would like to work on, and what's one habit you're just not that concerned about? Oh, gosh, that's a tough one. Bad habit? They want to know our bad stuff. Yeah, I don't know. What's a, what would be a bad... You know, I, I if I get nervous... Actually, shit, this is something... I don't Actually, I don't even have to be fucking nervous. If I'm sitting, I tend to wreck whatever the hell's in front of me. Or around me. Even right now, as I'm on this podcast, I'm twiddling with the freaking wire to my mic. I have it's just whatever. If there's a pen cap in front of me, that thing's going to be destroyed. If it's an eraser, it's going to be into a million different pieces. Um, you know, I would like to work on it, but to be honest, if I don't have an outlet with my hands, um, then I don't think I can function very well. I think it's just like a coping mechanism. I don't know. So know. are you counting that as the one you were trying to work on and also the one that you're not concerned about? You know. You don't get to do that. That's yeah, such, you're, that's it's a such a two for one. That's a weak ass bad it's habit. Both. Too. Yeah. <laughs> it's a terrible bad habit. It's both. I don't know, man. It's the one that first came to my head. I'll give you a bad habit you have because it's similar to mine. Oh, what a jerk. Yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah so he's piling it on you. So. Actually, this is no, this is uh, this is <laughs> Sal was a great reflection for myself when we first met because it used to fucking annoy me that he does this. Oh, that's so nice. Uh <laughs> But it, 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 we're always a reflection of ourselves. And not as handsome reflection. Yeah, right, no. We're always a reflection <laughs> of ourselves. And if it bothers me and him, that's obviously something I need to work on myself. So I, uh, although I'm jabbing him right now, it's also something that uh, helped me a ton. And uh, I have this habit. It's the, the leader in me, the teacher in me, uh, the, the guy who likes seeking out knowledge and sharing and giving. Like, and, and that's how I, it, it, it plays out in my head. Um, but I have this habit of like telling people all the time. Oh yeah, and you know, and I mean well by it, just like I know he means well by it. But it's fucking annoying sometimes when you're the, on the receiving end of that. And uh, I remember feeling that when we first met, and I remember, I remember I had empathy for him. I didn't like give him shit because I went fuck. That's me. Like Katrina always gives me a hard time that I do this to her. Like 
I go right into teach mode all the time. And it's like, instead of having dialogue or conversation or maybe asking her, what do you think or what do you know about this? I go right into telling you what I know. And it, uh, it rubs some people the wrong way. And uh, this was a, a bad habit of my own that I've continued to, to try and work on. And so <laughs> you're, I, you're talking about your your bad ha- habit of teaching by teaching me <laughs> on the podcast. <laughs> <laughs> well, I gave you your shot it's first. Also I gave you your shot to figure it out first, but... and you didn't. So <laughs> this is me now coming in. Let me help you out with yes. that fucking bad habit of yours, bro. <laughs> <laughs> I won't disagree. Actually, I, and funny, it's funny. I literally had a conversation this morning with Jessica about that exact thing. Okay. She has a tendency to do the same thing. Yeah. And uh, no, I, yeah, I know I for sure. I've, you know what it is? I think that's how I learn. It so is. So the more it's, I teach, the more way. I learn about it. Me too, it. me too, yeah, me yeah. too. One of the things that, so I have empathy for it. I totally do. Um, again, I always say on this podcast, your greatest strength is normally your greatest weakness. So I think that's also one of your greatest strengths. I know it's one of mine. I would, we talked about this in Tahoe. I learn a new word. I learn a, a, a new study. I learn something right away. What I've found is if I say it or do it myself or apply it or use it or teach it to somebody else, it becomes cemented in my own brain. Totally. And now it's 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 knowledge that I have acquired. It's not the first time I hear something, I don't feel like I've fully have acquired that knowledge until I teach it or to someone else. So I am empathetic to to you and understand that. But I at the same time, too, I know this is an area it's a bad habit that I have. I, I, I tend to do it. My uncle's also a great reflection for that for me because him and I are very much so alike. Uh, he works with the company. He drives me fucking crazy. <laughs> uh, sometimes, again, it's a reflection of myself. Like, oh my God, I probably do this to people too. So, uh, and and I know I'm I'm going off and uh, on my soapbox here with this about Sal, but this is an area. This is mine. So this is one of my areas that uh, I'm always trying to work on. Not talking uh, at people. Uh, that that's what it comes off if you if somebody else tells you, you feel like you're talking at them. It works so, well for a podcast, though. It does. <laughs> yeah. It serves no, it's us a superpower in, on the podcast. Right, right. It 100%. serves it serves us in, in in many other areas, but that's a bad habit. Um, I'm I'm I've I've spent a good majority of my life uh, being a talker, uh, being have people skills in that. I'm trying to spend the back half of my life being a better listener and, and observer. So uh, that's that's my personal uh, bad habit, I think, and what I'm trying to work on. Yeah. What, what's Justin's bad habit? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> help me out. Yeah, no, I know I have plenty. Uh, I I think for me, mainly in the like, this is something I've been working on for a long time is just being more open to criticism and you know, like allowing people to kind of chime in, in in my process where before that I was like completely would shut you off and mm-hmm. be like, no, fuck you. I got this, you know? And like, I wouldn't consider uh, anybody else's input if I felt like I have a, I had a very clear vision of the way that I was going to be able to approach any project or any kind of a, a thing. Like I get really annoyed when too many people would chime in and uh, I feel like I could handle it. And this is something that me and Courtney have battled. You know, it's a, it's a time old battle of like, I don't know if you should do it that way. And I'm like, I'm doing it this way. You know, <laughs> like, it's just how like I just very stubborn, very, very stubborn, very adamant that uh, uh, my process, the way I do things. And this is this was again, this was kind of a superpower of mine, too, when I was playing sports and like coaches would try and they'd break down film and and I would actually tell them insights that they didn't have. And so they were just like, they would just all of a sudden after a while, they'd be like, okay, we're hands free. You know, you got this. Uh, I see that it's working for you. I'm not really going to change, you know, whatever direction you're going with this. And so it just kept cementing my own ideas for things. And then, um, so anyway, I've been working on this a lot and like really trying to like consider, uh, if I'm, especially if I'm working with other people, like considering other people and their thought process along the way. So yeah, I would say what step one is just being able to identify it. Step two is to work on it. But boy, does that require a lot of um, like self-awareness, right? Yeah. Like, who wants to say that they're bad at something or that I, they do something it. that's annoying or whatever? It's like, right. you know, recently I realized how, 
in many ways how I can be annoying to, to certain people. Um, one way is the way that uh, Adam, um, you know, so eagerly mentioned. The other way... <laughs> <laughs> he was very quick on that one. Hey, was I not on point though or what? Was I not on Adam, point? Adam you guys a, are very similar. Adam has so. a bad habit of telling people what they're bad at. <laughs> no, all joking aside. Um, no, you hit it the nail on the head. Um, uh, so it, there, it's difficult to, to look at yourself because you don't want to know, you don't want to admit that you're wrong, you know? And what's funny is when you get to the point where you're like, like, yeah. Oh yeah, I, I definitely, you know, like I've been told probably my whole life that I didn't pay it, that I don't pay enough attention, and that I'm really forgetful or whatever. Mm-hmm. And you know, half the time I, I'm like, whatever, I don't pay attention <laughs> to what they're saying. Yeah, what would you say? Yeah, anyway, yeah. Uh, but you know, more recently I've really come to the realization that, geez, that's really fucking annoying, and I know I do that. Mm-hmm. So now it's like, how do I fix it? You know what I mean? How do I work on that? Um, it ain't easy. It's probably a habit because, you know, how does something turn into a habit? It's probably you just do it enough times to where it becomes second nature. Try to change second nature. Yeah, That is really, really, really tough thing to do. I think you have to be comfortable with yourself uh, before you can do that. Otherwise, you feel like, uh, you know, I feel like shit. You know what I mean? Yeah. But I'm pretty comfortable with myself, so it's all good. <laughs> anyway, with that, go to mindpumpfree.com and download our guides. They're all absolutely free. You can also find all of us on Instagram. You can find Justin at Mind Pump Justin. You can find me at Mind Pump Sal and Adam at Mind Pump Adam.